Okay, we're going to continue to make our way through the evolutionary uh, steps in terms of animals. And the group that we're going to look at this time is going to be that of the protosome. And the protosomes essentially, in terms of their embryonic development, and the embryonic development is yet again a key evidence with respect to how things are classified. In the embryonic development, we're looking at the fate of the blastopore. And that is going to distinguish the protosomes from that of the deuterosomes. And here are a few examples of uh, these different types of protosomes. Right here we have a type of fireworm. This is typical that we see in terms of the Caribbean. And notice it is segmented. So that's another thing in terms of what we see in animal evolution is segmentation, which is a little bit further up down the evolutionary line. These um, types of fireworms here, they are literally a type of annelid or a segmented worm. The annelid that you uh, dissected in class was that of the earthworm. And it too, you saw very distinctly the segments in which there are setae that were on each segment in order for it to help uh, grab the earth itself. Mollusks, here's an example of a mollusk. This would be a specific type. This would be a cephalopod. The head, foot, head, foot. So in other words, there's really no distinction between where the head and where the feet meet, but we know that there are the tentacles that the octopus has very clearly developed eyes and nervous system and this head region. The whole head region is that which is going to be very distinct of all uh, or most bilateral organisms. Remember the mollusks did not have, at least the clam did not have a distinct head region, but mollusks in general do have that distinct head region. And then we're going to also look at the arthropods which are the most numerous because they contain the insects or the class insecta. And the insects are the most numerous organisms. There are other types of arthropods here, for example, the cancer crab. And like all arthropods, they're going to have an exoskeleton. And the exoskeleton is going to have an evolutionary link to that of the kingdom fungi, as well as some protists, because it is made up of the chemical chitin. So chitin, embryonic development of the fate of the blastopore, these are going to give links to the protosome in terms of the animal kingdom. Some of the key points, remember, we have a common ancestor all animals, and it might be very similar to the protist. The difference is that animals, not only are they going to be multicellular, they're going to be heterotrophic. They're going to lack cell walls. So those are going to be, going to be some distinct characteristics that animals will have that protists don't have, nor uh, plants or anything else. So now we're going to also look at the fact that we have multicellularity, and that's, remember, it's going to branch off from the kingdom protease, it's going to branch off from the kingdom fungi. And so the next step here is this case of germ layers. Remember, the germ layers and radial symmetry, that's where the nadarians are going to be. And they have two germ layers. They have a quasi, what I'm going to say, a quasi-mesoderm. And the idea of the quasi-mesoderm gives way to the fact that it thus only has two germ layers, the endoderm and the ectoderm. So the uh, mesoderm is the one that's very, very, very lacking in terms of nadaria. And the type of organism that has no symmetry at all that we studied in class would be that of the sponges or, remember, the phylum periphera. Now we look at the whole another group. Uh, that we start to look at the true germ layers as well as the bilateral symmetry. And now we're going to look at this concept of the body cavity. The body cavity, remember, is going to be able to house internal organs. It's going to create a space, cavity, a space or some sort of compartment that will allow internal organs to be housed. And you saw this distinctly with respect to the earthworm. You saw as you cut through the epidermis, Inside it, you saw the reproductive organs as well as the crop, the gizzard, and that long intestinal uh, tract. The next step we're going to look at is the embryonic development, whether the fate of the blastopore is going to be that of the anus, thus it's going to be considered deuterostomic, or that if it's going to be the fate of the blastopore would be that of the mouth. So now we're looking at the next step, the next key point of animal evolution, the fate of the blastopore. Okay, and we know that in terms of the true coelomates, we're now looking at two true coelomates, the protosomes and deuterostomes. 
Prior to that, we might have seen the pseudocoelomates, such as the roundworms, or the acoelomates, such as flatworms. Mollusks, annelidae, arthropods, or protosomes. Deuterostromes include the uh, phylum Echinodermata and the phylum Chordata. What we're going to notice, though, is that the Echinodermata are rare because the fact that it, in, in their larval stage, their larval stage has a unique bilateral symmetry. And however, in their adult stage, they morph and they get this radial symmetry. Thus, we have to look at their embryonic development to consider it to be a deuterostrome and why it's not going to be way over there, lower, lower in the evolutionary scale along with nadarians. So the echinoderms are, have a unique appearance in the fact that they have the larval stage is bilateral and the adult stage is radial. Other than that, all other organisms that are deuterostromes are going to have bilateral symmetry. Okay, so we have to think about this in a very, 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 very small thing in terms of microscopic. After this concept of fertilization in which the sperm plus the egg unite and the zygote is formed, the cell undergoes many, 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 many divisions. And the idea is that there's this unique thing, it's called spiral cleavage, and one is called radio cleavage. All of these are characteristic are descriptions with respect to the embryonic stage. The key point that you have to recognize is the fact that in terms of a protosome, this blastopore is going to ultimately form the mouth, and subsequently the digestive tract is going to go from mouth to anus with the blastopore becoming the mouth. In light of deuterostomes, deuterostomes are going to be different because the deuterostomes, such as humans, such as chordates, it's going to be different because now the blastopore is going to become the anus. Granted, we have this archegonium or this process of gastrulation that is helping to form the um, digestive tract, but the key things that you need to recognize that to relate these terms together, for example, relate spiral cleavage with the blastopore becoming the mouth, that means protosome. The other key component is you got radiosymmetry, blastopore becoming the anus, that represents a deuterostome. Those are terms to associate with embryonic development and evidence for classification. Okay, the phylum mollusca, this is another, this is a pretty cool, it's a, it's a moon snail, it's a Lewis moon snail. And it has this beautiful type of uh, torquing in its shell, and it just oozes around, just crawls along the ground. The idea, it is indeed a mollusk. And remember, the eye, with the, the, the onset of the coelomates, free body movements, space for development of organization in terms of uh, organs, a much larger surface area. For example, the digestive tract doesn't, it's not just a straight tube, but for example, in humans and many chordates, the digestive tract not only is curved and uh, folded around in the abdominal cavity, which is one of the coelom, but inside it even has a larger surface area. The other thing is that many of the um, cavities, such as a thoracic cavity, might be protected in terms of uh, whether it's a shell here in this snail's case or in a endoskeleton's case with respect to the ribs and the sternum. Okay, and the annelids. One of the things that I did not introduce you to directly is this whole other type of skeleton called a hydroskeleton in which it uses water from the environment to help its structural support. Another thing is many slow-moving organisms, whether they are aquatic or land-based, are going to be what we call hermaph... They're going to be hermaphrodites meaning that every organism contains both the male and the female organs, or in other words, they're going to have testes as well as ovaries. And so in this case here, the advantage to a slow-moving organism is that if you are an earthworm, such as these two earthworms here, notice that they are lined up, juxtaposed each other, and what is literally going on is that this earthworm is fertilizing this earthworm and vice versa, this earthworm's eggs are being fertilized and this earthworm is also fertilizing the other. So what we have is this idea of we got two organisms and both organisms are actually receiving sperm from the other organism to fertilize the egg. That would be the idea of being hermaphroditic. It would be a huge advantage for all slow-moving organisms 
because that way there, when they encounter another organism of their same species, they can mate and produce more offspring. Okay, the other thing is, as we look at this whole process of jointed appendages, this is another specialization of segmentation. And the segmentation is going to allow for specialization. So here's a little crayfish, jointed appendage. Here's the abdomen, this special cephalothorax. You're going to see this in class as you dissect them. And we also have a hermit crab. This is another aquatic species. And the hermit crab itself, it too has segmented skeleton. And at the same time, it picked up a nice little shell to help itself in terms of protecting. Many of these will have separate species, particularly that of the crayfish. And hopefully in class you'll be able to determine which are male and which are female, depending on what we have in other, this uh, specialized swimmerette. So they're going to have specialized segments that are going to have to help, that, that will help in their reproductive process. Nice little classic addition. A couple of things. Uh, insects. Whether it's a beautiful type of moth or whether it's a grasshopper, insects are going to have three distinct body regions, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The class arthropoda, the uh, crustaceans, for example, many of them only have two. It's a fused head and thorax, whereas the insects will have the true three regions. And insects have two different types of life cycles, either a complete and such as a butterfly, a regular fly, such as a house fly, or even a type of moth, they're going to have a complete metamorphosis, which they go from an egg to a larval stage, which often people see and call maggots, to a pupal stage, or pupa, puporium. And then ultimately, that's also could be called a crystallis, to then an adult stage. And ultimately, the adult is going to be sexually mature to lay a mate and lay eggs. The larval stage, its main job is to eat. It will eat and eat and eat in order to acquire a lot of nutrients for the next stage, which is the pupal stage, or the crystallis, in which this whole transformation, or this metamorphosis, will go on. Completely change from the larval stage to the butterfly stage or the moth stage that all of us recognize as an insect. Then we have an incomplete. And grasshoppers, locusts, and those types of organisms undergo this stage, which they, which they go from an egg to what we call a nymph, which looks like a miniature adult but not sexually uh, mature. The nymph basically grows. It molts to become an adult. D and the adult becomes sexually mature in order to mate and produce eggs. So those are the two distinct life cycles of insects. Just some few comparisons between these two. Obviously, we look at some of the ways the organisms have adapted. Crayfish have gills. Grasshoppers have spherical. Both are going to have a high surface area to help with respect to absorbing the oxygen into the tissues. And so subsequently, we will also see how they get rid of waste. They can, uh, the crayfish, because they're aquatic, can get rid of a more toxic waste uh, called ammonia than that of uric acid, which is a less toxic. So subsequently, the grasshoppers do have to expend a little bit more energy in order to get rid of their metabolic waste. And often it's nitrogenous waste. Nit not, remember, the nitrogenous waste is going to contain the element nitrogen, may even have ni the nitrogen molecule in it. But that's the whole idea to get rid of the nitrogenous waste, which are results of often protein digestion or protein breakdown. So these things become toxic in our body if, and that's one of the main goals of the excretory system is to remove these toxic wastes from our body, from mainly our blood.